Hello, and welcome to today's show, Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, international leadership expert and trusted advisor. Welcome to Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I am so delighted that you joined me today. I want to give a big thank you to those of you who are listening. I also want to give a great big shout out to all of you listening around the world. I'm delighted and so grateful that you are here today. I sure hope you're enjoying a fabulous day and that you're having a fantastic week. Because you know what? In the grand song of the universe, life is very short. It's short and sweet and very precious. So I hope you're making a difference in your own life because when you do, you also make a difference in somebody else's life. Now, a lot of us, a lot of folks really want to make their life count for something, but they don't know how or they don't know where to begin. So they ask me, Dr. Gloria, how do you do that? How do you make your life count? Well, it's very simple. Very simple. You make your life count day by day, step by step, moment by moment, every single day. 365, 24-7. Now I'll say much more about that later on. Right now, it's time to step back and listen in. That's right, it's time to hit the pause button. It's time for today's episode, which is all about the power of one person. Now, I want you to imagine that we're in the same room. Maybe it's your kitchen or your living room, and I'm sitting right across the table from you. I'm pouring you a cup of coffee or tea, and we are about to have a small cup of what matters. So again, today's focus is all about the power of one, the power of one person who can be the difference, who makes the difference in their own life or in someone else's life. Now, today's episode focuses on one of my favorite people on the planet. Her name is Gwendolyn Brooks. Her life is what Legacy Living Make Your Life Count is all about. Now, most of us know Ms. Brooks as a marvelous poet. I know her as a poet extraordinaire. I also know Ms. Gwendolyn as a kind, gentle, smart, fiercely caring human being. For me, she was the one person who made a difference in my life at a time in my life, you know, that just the right time in my life. She showed up for me and made a difference during a particular season when I really needed it. So what does that mean? Well, sometimes a season is just for a minute, for a very, very short time. And yet the impact of someone showing up in your life for that moment in time, their impact ripples far out beyond the few months or weeks or days or even a few hours that you're graced by that person's presence. I was so blessed by Gwendolyn Brooks. She was one of those individuals who made a difference, who made a significant difference in my life. She was there at just the right time, at just the right place, in just the right season of my life. In fact, I had the good fortune to meet Miss Brooks not once, but twice. Now, I talk about both of those occasions in part one of this podcast, so be sure to listen to it. Today's topic is poetry in motion, so we're going to pick up where we left off in that first podcast. Again, it's all about the power of one person, and that person that we're focusing on is Gwendolyn Brooks. So we are here to celebrate Ms. Gwendolyn and to lift up this prolific poet, writer, teacher, lover of children, activist, publisher, and humanitarian. 
I can just feel her presence here with me today. I feel her presence in so many ways. One of the most powerful ways that Gwendolyn's presence shows up is through the voices of other poets, the voices of other writers, the voices of other artists. So let's keep this real, right? We would not have a Lucille Clifton or Nikki Finney or Rita Dove or Tyimba Jess, Cornelius Eady, Toy Derricott, Elizabeth Alexander, Natasha Treathway, Hayes Davis, Carl Dargan, Tara Betts, Amanda Gorman, and I dare say dozens and dozens of other poets and writers, African American and otherwise. We would not have these poets or their poetries without Gwendolyn Brooks. That's the power of one person. The one person who impacts so many lives and the ripple effect is positively astounding. Now, many years ago, when I was working with high school students who were looking for a poet with a strong sense of narrative style, with a strong command of language and a robust imagination, with a wide-ranging repertoire of experience, experiences that could be distilled into the sensuous language captured by the sights and sounds and smell and tastes, the tactile worlds that are conveyed in poems. In my students' search for such a poet, they would inevitably turn to the poetry of Gwendolyn Brooks. Why? Because it was in Ms. Gwendolyn's poems that my students learned so much. They learned about love, about tenderness, about cruelty and compassion, about hatred and bigotry and perseverance. They learned about defeat and courage and faithfulness and fear and vainglory and victory. It was in Miss Gwendolyn's poems that my students learned about voice, the necessity of voice, the necessity of the poet's voice, as well as the necessity of their own voices. So again, I'm so very delighted that you joined us today. Did you know that Ms. Brooks is the first female African-American poet to win the Pulitzer Prize, and she's the first female African-American to become Poet Laureate of the United States of America. Now, during her life, she was awarded numerous honorary doctoral degrees, numerous prizes, and many, many other worthy tributes. But the best way to introduce our woman of the hour is not by sharing her many, many accolades. Oh, no. (laughs) The best way to introduce Gwendolyn Brooks is through her own words, through her own poetry and prose. Now, this woman, with a keen sense of observation, social and emotional intelligence, and a great love for people, that's the person we're honoring today. This woman whose great gift was to see into and inhabit the personhood of another person and to write in a voice that sounded like their own first-hand account. This account could be about a, a life lived in a frugally small, cramped, and cluttered cold water flat, or the kind of living space that was furnished with the carpet of kinship, enlarged by a fondness for fellowship, and warmed by the hearth of love. In one of her poems, Miss Brooks writes about Paul Robeson. In this poem, she boldly declares, We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Wow. 
That's pretty powerful stuff. In other words, Ms. Brooks is saying, then and now, we belong to one another. We belong to one another. And thank goodness for that. Miss Gwendolyn's voice, and now I'm talking about her actual voice, was very measured and steady. Her voice was tinted with hues of the South. The body, the sheer weight and measure of her voice had the the kind of gravitas that made you listen real close, that made you pay attention. Her voice hung in the air, embracing you with a sense of certainty, with a knowing and a deep wisdom of a life blessed with abundance. Now, I'm not talking about monetary abundance. I'm talking about the abundance of people and place and the mighty, enduring presences of poetry. Hers was a voice that sparked diverse responses. One response was a common thread, a response Miss Brooks heard throughout her life. You read your poem so beautifully. How does this happen? And she would respond, when you're writing a poem, you're not sitting there all cold and dull and dim. You're all excited. Miss Brooks also said, I tried to read poetry to give an impression of how I felt when I was writing it. Now, just a few moments ago, I shared the closing lines of one of her poems, the poem called Paul Robeson. Here is the whole poem. Paul Robeson. That time... We all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day. The major voice, the adult voice, forgoing rolling river, forgoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond. Warning in music words devout and large that we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. In this amazing, amazing and beautiful poem, Ms. Gwendolyn distills a life, the life of renowned scholar, activist, and humanitarian Paul Robeson. This human being who was blacklisted by Hollywood, this human being who had the courage and fortitude, and integrity to wield his magnificent intellect as a force for human dignity, to lift up his mighty voice as an instrument for change, to convey by his presence the power and the indomitable force of the human spirit. This is Paul Robeson the human being. I'll read that poem again, Paul Robeson. That time we all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day, the major voice, the adult voice, forgoing rolling river, forgoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond. Warning 
in music words devout and large. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Another one of my favorite poems by Miss Brooks, and probably one of her most well-known poems, is another short one, and it's called We Real Cool. We Real Cool. The Pool Players, Seven at the Golden Shovel. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. You know, it's such a short poem, yet it is filled with atmosphere. I'll read it again. We real cool. The pool players, seven at the golden shovel. We real cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight we sing sin we then gin we jazz june we die soon mm. poems are like that poems are like that sometimes they want to be read a second time <laughs> or even a third or fourth time right now, unlike being in a museum, right, or taking in sculpture or painting, where we can pause and consider for a good long while, the words of a poem can fly away. They just fly away from us as soon after they land on our ear. They are gone. If you like hearing poems like I do, I encourage you to download this podcast so you can listen to it again and again. And if you like to hear poems read on the poet's own breath, you can just go to a good poetry website and listen to an audio recording. You can also find audio and video recordings of Miss Brooks sharing some of her poems on YouTube. <laughs> How cool is that? You know, as I did my research for today, I was absolutely amazed at what I found out about Miss Brooks and her prolific volume of written work, as well as her service in her community with youth in our schools, youth on our streets, with prisoners, with people in taverns, right, and bars, and in churches. Here's another poem by Miss Gwendolyn. I know I've said that, you know, I have a lot of favorites already, right? Well, this is one of my favorites as well. And this poem is called Kitchenette Building. Kitchenette Building. We are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound. Not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. But could a dream send up through onion fumes its white and violet, fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall, flutter or sing an aria down these rooms, 
even if we were willing to let it in, had time to warm it, keep it very clean, anticipate a message, let it begin. We wonder, but not well. Not for a minute, since number five is out of the bathroom now, we think of lukewarm water, hope to get in it. Now, one of the reasons I love this poem, and I love it for many, many reasons, but I think the most significant reason is because it helps me recall in an instant my own life, my own life of living in the projects. Now, these were not the projects in Chicago, but the the projects in Detroit, right? Detroit, Michigan. And it also connects me to the dreams that so many people had. Dreams that were seldom realized because the urgency of life. I mean, the urgency what was right in front of you day in and day out, week in and week out, just took over. And you know what? Over time, the dreams began to grow smaller and smaller until one day there was no dream. There was only the concrete reality of the onion fumes from somebody else's cramped apartment, right? The smell of your own or somebody else's garbage whenever you walk down the hall toting your family's garbage to drop it into the chute that led to the incinerator, right? The concrete reality of waiting for one of your neighbors to hurry up and finish in the bathroom so you could have your turn. The concrete reality of the hot smell and scorching sting of asphalt, the playground for us children just outside the revolving front door. Miss Brooks is so attentive and exquisitely skilled at capturing the essence of a person's life in just a few well-chosen words and images and tastes and smells. One of the hallmarks of her writing is that she's also gifted in being with people, not merely writing about them. Sabrina Miller, in writing an article for the Chicago Tribune about the legacy of Gwendolyn Brooks, Ms. Miller reminds us that long before the black arts movement of the 1960s brought fiery rhetoric into the mainstream, Ms. Brooks was holding poetry workshops in her home with members of the notorious street gang called the Black Stone Rangers. Susan L. Taylor, former editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine, calls Brooks a master writer who communicated the most profound ideas in a simple, accessible way. She was truly a humble queen among us who loved her blackness, who loved being a woman, and who had a generosity of spirit that is unparalleled. Can I just get an amen? <laughs> now, here is one of Miss Gwendolyn's simple, accessible, and I might add savvy poems called Sadie and Maud. Sadie and Maud. Maud went to college. Sadie stayed home. Sadie scraped life with a fine tooth comb. She didn't leave a tangle in. Her comb found every strand. Sadie was one of the livingest chicks in all the land. Sadie bore two babies under her maiden name. Maud and Ma and Papa nearly died of shame. When Sadie said her last so long, her girls struck out from home. Sadie left as heritage her fine tooth comb. Maud, who went to college, is a thin brown mouse. She is living all alone in this old house. Now, this poem 
is simple and accessible. Yes, it is. And like any good poem, there's much, much more to it than meets the eye. That's where Savvy comes in. You see, on the surface, this poem is about two women, one named Sadie, the other named Maud. But when we pay attention, and when we hear the song beneath the song of this poem, it really is about relationship. It is about our relationships with other people, our relationship with the world, our relationship with ourselves. And on another layer, this poem is a metaphor for life. A metaphor for life, for how we live. And you know me, I always say how we live is how we do everything else, right? It's how we parent. It's how we teach. It's how we serve. It's how we love. It's how we lead in any aspect of our lives. Now, if you want to learn more about Miss Gwendolyn Brooks and her life of writing and service, be sure to visit the Poetry Foundation website. That's right, it's the Poetry Foundation website, and the URL is www.poetryfoundation.org. Okay, www.poetryfoundation.org. There you can read more about Miss Gwendolyn's life, read her poems, and even hear her read some of her own poems. You can also find a wonderful tribute to Miss Gwendolyn's life in a beautiful book called I Dream a World. This book is composed by Brian Lanker. I Dream a World is a lovely photo narrative book. It's oversized. In fact, the photo portraits take up one full page. And on the facing page of each spread is a narrative. Words from each woman's own mouth. Words that paint a picture of who she is. Words that paint a picture of her values, her loves, her family, her work, her struggles, her hopes, her joys. Her facing and dealing with barriers and obstacles. And ultimately words that paint a vivid picture of her victories and triumphs. The book was published in 1989. When I bought it many, many years ago, I recognized many of the women in it. And some of them I became familiar with only after reading their narratives and studying their photos and just looking into their eyes. Looking into the eyes of a woman who looked back at me from those very pages. More than that, I imagine these individuals as as full-bodied, not simply as talking heads, so to speak. I imagine them as full-bodied and standing, standing on the shoulders of the many men and women who made a way, who built roads and bridges, who gave these women a place to stand, who gave these women a place to belong, who gave these women the oxygen to dream, the centering oxygen to keep on breathing into their dream over and over and over and over and over again. Even now, all these years later, I continue to be inspired by these amazing women who grace the pages of Brian Lanker's book, I Dream a World. I continue to be inspired by their lives, for they are a fountain of renewal and rejoicing. As we celebrate Miss Gwendolyn, I'll call the names of some of her sisters who stand alongside her. These women are divas and dancers, actors and athletes, educators and evocateurs. These women are artists, activists, advocates. They are poets and politicians. They are community organizers and champions for our children. Some of these women are now part of the ages. 
but they are all women who have finally been knitted into the larger fabric, who have been woven into the larger tapestry of the history of the United States of America. Mercy. Hallelujah. These women include Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King, Lena Horne, Shirley Chisholm, Fanny Lou Hamer, Alice Walker, Angela Davis, Toni Morrison, Leontine Price, Marian Anderson, Merle Evers, Maya Angelou, Barbara Jordan, Odetta, Ruby D, and more of my favorites, Sonia Sanchez, Catherine Dunham, Janetta Cole, B. Richards, Ernestine Anderson, Willie Mae Ford Smith, Betty Shabazz, Wilma Rudolph, Alexa Kennedy, Septima P. Clark, Eva Jesse, and of course, Gwendolyn Brooks. I consider all of these women mentors, all of them. Join me in celebrating these women who changed the game. These women who transformed the world, their own world as well as the world beyond their immediate spheres of influence. Can I just tell you something? To call the names of these women is a blessing and honor. To breathe their sweet fragrance and to sing the marvelous music of their names is litany. It is hallelujah. It is healing prayer. Oh, my. (laughs) Theirs is a music that carries the enchanting melody, the intoxicating aroma of gardenia, honeysuckle, night-blooming jasmine, hyacinth, tuber rose. To call their names is a prayer lifted up to heaven, carried, carried on the wings of the dove. It is a precious holiness carried in our ancestors' bosoms, lifted up to the rafters in rooms that breathe with sweet remembrance of bread broken together, in rooms that exhale shouting and wailing and falling on our knees as we call on the sweet name of Jesus. It is the red dirt roads, the blood orange dusk, and the pipe drift of cherry tobacco lifted onto the breezes at dawn. It is a humming and trembling and clapping our hands as we lift them up, as we sing our hallelujahs, for we have come this far. We have come this far by grace. Can I just tell you something else? (laughs) We are blessed by these women who dreamed, by these women who sacrificed and persevered, who cleared paths and broke new ground for you and your children. Gwendolyn Brooks signifies and represents with all of these women. She does. Miss Gwendolyn, (laughs) we absolutely salute you, we honor you, we love you, and we celebrate you. During National Poetry Month, during Women's History Month, And not only then, we celebrate you every single day. We celebrate you for making the invisible visible, for your compassionate artistry and marvelous gifts of being awake to life and turning life, the good, the gracious, the ugly, and the tragic, into astonishing works of reverence, into astounding works of art. We express our deep, deep gratitude. 
we thank you for showing us the power of poetry in motion and the power of one person, of one person who lives their life to make a difference. Now that's exactly what we talked about earlier. And I promise to say more about how you can do the same thing to make a difference and to make your life count. So, here we go. You can make your life count by being there for someone who simply needs the sweet, precious fragrance of your presence. So what do I mean by that? Well, maybe they just need you to listen to them talk about their day, or about how their mom is doing, or maybe they need to talk about their relationship with their 13-year-old daughter or son. And they don't want to just talk with anybody. What they really need is to talk to you. Why? Because you listen. You listen with a smile in your heart. You listen without having to jump in and give advice. You listen because you really care. You make your life count by the simple loving things you do for someone. Maybe you make your wife a a cup of her favorite tea, not because she asked you, but because you know it's one of her favorites. You also do it because you know her love language. Or maybe you play her favorite music. Or perhaps you go for a nice, long walk with her. Not because you need the exercise, but just because. Now maybe you take a a time out of time, maybe 30 minutes, 20 minutes to go through your closets and you pull out your gently used shirts or blouses, your gently used sweaters and slacks, and you fold them up and take them to your local Goodwill or thrift store. Or maybe you take whatever extra money you have and you buy some food to donate to your local food bank. Or maybe you read a story to a child. Did you know to a young girl or boy, attention is spelled (laughs) L-O-V-E, right? To make a difference, you don't have to do anything fancy or extraordinary. You don't have to be a superhero or, or superheroine, right? None of those capes, right? You just have to have a heart full of love. You simply have to serve others without any expectation of return. You could pick a handful of fresh herbs from your deck or garden and give them to a neighbor. Or maybe you could bake a batch of cookies and take them to the nursing home. Be sure to give some to your mom when you visit her. And give some to the staff. You could also call a friend or remember when you write a a note to someone, just tuck in a few stamps or a bag of tea or a pack of coffee, right? My sister calls my mom every day just to say hello and to tell her how much she loves her. When I call my mom, I love to sing songs with her, the song she sang as a little girl. Now, sometimes she can't remember my name but she remembers those songs. Sometimes I'll read her stories or share scripture with her. Now, what's my point? It's simply this. You can make a difference. You can be the difference with who you already are, with what you already have. You make a difference by showing up as who you are, day by day, every day of your life. You make a difference by being grateful for who you are, being grateful for family and friends and neighbors and co-workers and by counting your blessings. Now we can go beyond simply counting our blessings, right? We can go beyond by being a blessing. Not too long ago, I was teaching a class and it was a class for leaders who want to take their faith into their work, not as pastors or rabbis, right? But these leaders want to take their faith into the nonprofit 
and education in civic and corporate sectors. They work as police officers and firefighters. They work as agency directors in mental health, as leaders on our school board, right? They're leaders in the military, administrators in our healthcare system. They're educators who work with our youth. All of these folks are about making a difference. I say all of this because just like you and me, sometimes these leaders, okay, these leaders that I'm talking about, they get so focused on making a difference in somebody else's life that guess what? They forget about themselves, right? Now that's what happens when you're so focused on serving, when you're focused on passing it on, when you're focused on giving back. So if you're born to serve like me, (laughs) we have to remember that one of the best ways to make a difference is to first take good care of yourself, right? Because we all know that if we were to create a list of our to-do items, of our to-serve items, we would be nowhere on that list. So one of the first things to remember is to take good care of yourself so that you can serve with a healthy body, mind, and soul. How we live is how we serve. It's how we serve, teach, parent, lead, right? In any aspect of our lives. So let's remember to take good care of ourselves every single day. 365, 24-7. All right. Now, if you missed any part of this week's episode, you can listen to the recording at your convenience. You can even listen to it on the go, right? So check us out at www.talknetworkradio.com forward slash hosts forward slash legacy living. Now that's quite a mouthful. (laughs) All right. So I'm going to say it again. That's www.talknetworkradio.com forward slash hosts forward slash legacy living. Now, if you want to be the change you seek, Be sure to listen to this podcast again and again, and be sure to tell somebody, right? Share the wealth. You can also find me on iTunes, Audible, Alexa, SoundCloud, iHeart, TuneIn, Spreaker.com, and just as I mentioned, Talk Network Radio, and so many other places. You can learn more about my work and Legacy Living Make Your Life Count, by visiting the Gloria Burgess website. That's G-L-O-R-I-A, B as in boy, U-R-G-E-S-S dot com, the Gloria Burgess website. And as I've mentioned before, if you love to be inspired, you can actually subscribe to my inspirations right on my website. You just scroll down a little bit, look on the right sidebar until you see a place to add your email address to subscribe to my weekly inspirations. It's that simple. Now, each week, you're going to get a lovely photograph and a very short quotation that inspires you. You can also find me on LinkedIn or on Facebook. On Facebook, you can find me at facebook.com forward slash dr for doctor, dr Gloria Burgess, Ph.D forward slash. You can hear and see me by visiting the TEDx website and listening to one of my TED Talks. Just type in my name to find me there. Now, before I close today, I want to thank each of you again for being here, for allowing me to share a bit about my journey with what legacy living is all about. Not just living and learning, but living and learning and serving so that you make a difference in your own life and in the lives of others. It's about being on purpose every single day, 365, 24-7. Legacy living is one of the many ways to make your life count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, and this is Legacy Living Make Your Life Count. Please join me again next time for Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. And remember, 
Don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what legacy living is all about. Have a fantastic day. Make the days in your life count. God bless you. That's our show today. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess. I hope you'll join me again next time. Until then, don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what legacy living is all about. Here's to you. Have a fantastic day and be sure to make it a yes kind of day. Remember to celebrate the music of your life. Make the days in your life.